Hello everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. So, we are going to continue on mostly with the Year of Rogue Dragons here. However, I made a bit of a mistake, and uh, I'll tell you what happened. So, I was reading the priest stuff, and I started on Lady of Poison. I'll go ahead and let you know... Lady of Poison has a skip for me. I just could not find anything worthwhile in it. It was just so dull. It's by Bruce R. Cordell, which is kind of shocking because in general, I at least find his stuff readable, and I've enjoyed a short story or two by him that we've read enough that I would think I would enjoy a book by him, but man, this one was just bad. I'm pretty sure this is the one with, like, the Ragged Man, and it just... Uh, it just didn't work for me. And reading all of these priest descriptions, it really felt like they're just trying to be like, oh, the, you know, you think of priests and you think of, like, clerics and crap, but it's gonna be dark and edgy and blah, 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 blah. And this one just felt like the worst of that completely. Ugh, it was terrible. So after that, um, you know, I use little mnemonics to help me know which one I'm going to next. And I, th I thought, okay, the, the uh, priests are L, M, and Q. I forgot there were four of them. So there's Lady of Poison, Mistress of the Night, and Queen of the Depths. So I went ahead and read M next, because that's what's listed next on our list. But I forgot that there's also a fourth one, Maiden of Pain, which is also an M, and I accidentally read that. So let's talk about Maiden of Pain, even though it's a little out of order, simply because, A, I don't know if there's any reason to be putting it in 1374. I'm assuming something gets mentioned here that makes sense for that, etc., etc. But in any case, this is written by Cameron Franklin, who, a uh, quick little search, because I, I was trying to remember, have we read anything by him before? And apparently not. Um, it, it looks like just going on Amazon here really fast. Cameron Franklin was picked to write this novel as a result of an open call for proposals that resulted in 500 submissions. First of all, I'm pretty shocked that there were only 500 submissions. Franklin's was determined to be the best, and he was offered a contract for the novel. This is his first novel. Well, good for Cameron. This is, uh, I would say, one of the most unique <laughs> novels that we've read. Essentially, this is exploring a priestess who belongs to the Le Leviatar religion, which is, you know, kind of a self-flagellant sort of thing, and um, it really felt like the priesthood aspect was explored enough and in a way that made it interesting. I don't particularly remember it, but it, it made sense in the way that Cameron wrote it. It's also one of the more unique novels in the sense that it's really all over the place. Like, it's it starts out and it feels like, uh, <laughs> it, it feels like some old, like, 19th century Victorian novel because, or, or like, Sound of Music or, uh, except an evil Sound of the Music because, uh, Sound of Music because... It starts out with this priestess being forced to go and become this mistress for a young girl who's really willful. If you're like me and you kind of hate kids, this is a great book. Because this kid is just a brat and evil, and essentially winds up putting her mistress in jail. Because she's a priestess, and so she says she can do magic, and this isn't a place where magic is outlawed. La da 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 she winds up in jail, you know, like on her second day, and it's like, holy crap, so... Then, I, and I can't remember, I, I think it's because there's this, uh, there's this cabal of people who are wanting to overthrow the anti-magic stance of the city. They stage this coup and break out all these magic users, including her, at the most opportune moment. And so suddenly, she, suddenly she's going with them um, out into the swamps because it turns out that the kind of main person left in the anti-magic Cabal is actually a were crocodile, and he was looking for help because there's a were crocodile, were rat war going on out in the swamp. And so, for about a third of the book, we're just dealing with this weird island of Dr. Moreau subplot that's like, where the hell did this come from? And what is our main story? Eventually she goes back and the main plot is dealt with, and the ending I really liked, and it felt like something that Salvatore would try to do and kind of screw up uh, by making you hate a character too much. But the way that this ended made so much sense tying together where it started. I would say there are some choices made before Penn was put to paper on this that don't make any sense, and I'm kind of shocked that this got chosen from fan-submitted proposals since... As much as I enjoyed the book, in a, in, a, in a pitch setting, it's horrible. Like, if you try to... because I mean, listen to me trying to explain it. 
It's not straightforward at all. It's not very linear. It's got an entire third or so that has that, that's really pretty much skippable because it just has, you know, you can just skip from like they're saved to she's back in the city and not have missed much. Really, I mean, plot-wise, nothing important. But since I didn't know it wasn't important at the time that I read it, I enjoyed it. I was like, okay, all right, we're in a were rat were crocodile war. I'll run with this, you know? So this is one of those books where it's very strange, just all over the map, which I like. You've probably noticed by now, if you've been listening to enough of these, that in my book, kind of the biggest sin, if you will, is being dull, is being predictable. This definitely was not that. It wasn't necessarily good, but I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. And if you like something that is going to defy your expectations in a lot of ways... I would say pick this up and have a fun time with it. Okay, so I'll get to the other priest books later, even though they should kind of come next. Let's get back to 1373. Let's talk about The Rage by Richard Lee Byers, part one of the Year of Rogue Dragons trilogy. Which, as you can probably guess, is decently important to this year, since it is the Year of Rogue Dragons. I find it odd that since the years are known in advance... And everybody knows that these prophecies do come true in some way, shape, or form. That more people aren't worried whenever a year comes up that's called, like, years of Ro- the Year of Rogue Dragons, you know? To me, it, it seems like people should be kind of freaking out a little bit. But, for whatever reason, you know, like I, like I think I mentioned before, there's one book where they're like, ah, oh, the dragons are acting weird or whatever, and it's like, well, it is the Year of Rogue Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should worry. Especially if, like, 1374 was, you know, the year of scorched earth. And since it's a year of lightning storms, that seems a decently possible causal connection. I don't know. In any case, nobody worries about it. Year of Rogue Dragons follows a party of adventurers who specialize in taking down dragons. So it starts with them kind of taking down a dragon or two for this village. And through it, realizing that there's a rage going on. Which a rage is when dragons start acting crazy, you know? It's essentially rabies uh, for dragons. And they're kind of drawn into this larger plot where this rage is going to be taking over every dragon for a freakishly long amount of time, and it could be a world-ending event because, you know, if all the dragons go crazy... Well, not a world-ending, but a, um, um, a every-race-but-dragon-ending event... So, of course, this is, this is a problem, and these guys are trained at taking down dragons, so why not, why, why not them, right? So they start moving forward with uh, stopping this. First, they go and warn some people, uh, and, and through that, gain some trust. Through that, they're following, um, I think the bad guy in this, his name is Samister, which I thought was a really good name. I think Byers does a really good job of naming people. You know, a lot of these, you read them, and the names are just so difficult to pronounce, to get past your tongue. He has Samister, and uh, uh, I think his main character is Dorn, which isn't great, but it's not a a tough name. Um, And then he's got, like, Pavel and Will. I can never tell which one's a halfling and which one's a dwarf, but in any case, they, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I'm trying to remember is... The character that I really liked was a flying elf, and uh, his name is, like, Tegan or something like that. You know, all these names that sound almost familiar, like Robert Jordan. Love him or hate him, you have to admit he's great at naming. You know, Rand, uh, uh, Perrin, Matt with one T, you know, all these things that are practically one letter away from normal English names. So they have a familiarity and not a... um, uh, you know, no alienness to them, yet unfamiliar enough to put you in a different setting. Anyway, the plot, not extremely important here, mainly set up. I, I really liked a lot of things that Byers did here, including fairy dragons, including other races. I mean, our, our, our party is made up of, like, this dragon-hating... He keeps calling him a half-golem, but essentially he's just a dude with, like, a uh, metal arm and hand, so it's like... Half golem seems a bit intense to me, but in any case, um, also a, a dragon and um, the flying elf, and I think there's one other person I'm forgetting about, possibly another halfling. Anyway, you know, a good mix of characters, a, a wide reaching scope. I, I love, especially like at the end, I don't know if it's an epilogue or the last chapter, we get into Samister's head a little bit, and he's like self hating and. You know, essentially, like, pulling out his... He, he, pulling out his... Well, he doesn't have hair. He's a lich now, I think. But 
you know, like hitting his head against the wall and being like, mother, I mean, it's, it's almost to that level. But then buyers, you know, I'm noticing this more and more and more with our authors. And uh, I, I started kind of pointing or uh, underlining a few of these things because they just really started bugging me. So listen to this uh, little few little sections from buyers. Here, here he is at a, a, a dragon get together. To a human, it might have seemed a cacophony of bestial rumbles, hisses, and roars. But to someone capable of understanding, it was music, a symphony expressive of the wisdom and nobility of a great people. Yes, Richard, that's what foreign languages that you don't understand are like. If you don't understand them, they sound all jumbled and rah 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 If you do understand them, they make sense. Thank you for explaining foreign languages to us. I mean, it just, it's like, what purpose does that section serve let me um uh <laughs> this is another this one is just ridiculous i just found this so funny for some reason just the understatedness of this uh someone explaining the the, the history of all these bad things and and uh i think somebody asks her let me just double check here uh yeah it's like if your people possessed all this he asked why would they abandon it the hobgoblins came Amra replied i i just I don't know. That's just so weird to me. However, since I was uh, pointing out some of the bad bits, I thought I'd also point out, a gentleman never lies to a lady about anything except his marital status or the depth of his devotion. Great little quote there. And and basically, almost everything that Tegan says is really, really good. But we just have this stuff where people over-explain things, and I don't know why. Salvatore overwrites, but in a way that it almost feels as if he's giving stage direction simply because his stuff reads so much like a screenplay. And and you kind of feel like, Bob, we get it. L- leave that to the director, you know, uh, or the reader. Um, here, I, I, we, I just kept coming across things where we would over-explain for no apparent reason, you know? Just like, this is how right and left work, it felt like at times. It was just, we, we don't need this explain and I don't know why they're doing it so that's getting really frustrating and honestly what it feels like to me and I have no idea if this is the case or not but what it feels like to me is you know obviously they have kind of a a, a box they have to write in 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 terms of content style maturity level which I, I I didn't even mention it because it doesn't really matter to me but since we're talking about it I uh, I thought it was kind of fun that um uh, the Erebus Kale stuff, somebody says shit, and it's like, oh my god, we've we've broken that level, you know, we've gone to like 13-year-old level of writing now, it's exciting. And and they say god's damn in there a lot, which I think is just cool. Anyway, uh, but I am a seven-year-old at heart, I guess. Anyway, and, and one of the things that this box has to fit is somewhere around, I believe, 100,000 words, like almost exactly that length. And then uh, you know, there are certain cases, uh, Cormier novel, uh, City, of, City of Splendors, some instances where they can go larger, but I think they essentially have to hit a certain amount. Like, the fighters, I think, are all shorter, but for the most part, I think they have this, this very specific box, and, you know, let's, let's say it's 100,000, let's say it's like 90 to 100,000, right? And it really feels as if some of the authors get to this point, and they're finished, and they're like, okay, this is good, I feel really confident about this. Oh, crap, I've got 75,000 words. Uh, i got to go in and just add some verbiage. And, and that's what a lot of these things feels like, you know? Like, originally he was like, the dragons gathered talking, and he's like, hmm... I could say something more here. Well, you know, dragons talking, if you didn't understand it, would sound weird. I'll put something there. And, you know, and they're overthinking these things because, of course, you know, of course we get that. We we know that. We understand what a foreign language is. But it's this last minute. I, as I say, I have no idea. And I would love to talk to some of the authors and find out if that's the case or if it's just one of those things like where Byers has a tendency to overwrite and he has a bad editor I, I i don't know i just i don't know uh but it is bugging the living shit out of me so i am bringing it up here coincidentally in an amusing way not ironically you'll probably notice that i do the same thing 20 times over <laughs> when i'm talking about these things over explain something and i could probably edit out half of what i say a, a lot of times but this is extemporaneous so it's forgivable shut up <laughs> let's go ahead and talk about the Ruby Guardian, part two of the Science Verabar, which has a similar problem, and I noted some quotes from there. Oh no, actually, the, the only bits that I noted were 
in this one section, the, this group of guys are convincing this woman to be on their side, essentially. And I don't know why, but Reed decided every single time she went through an emotional shift, he has to describe precisely her face, and it was almost as if it was a contest with himself that he would never use the same word twice. And the two that I noted, but they're all through here, Falah, which, okay, we were talking about bad names, right? Falah, how hell easy is that name to remember? Falah could see her visage of misery transformed into one of hatred. Take out the face thing. Falah saw her misery turn to hatred. Can you and I both infer that he's getting that from her face? Why is that even necessary? Later, there was sudden fire in Lobra's countenance. Her countenance. Lobra had a sudden fire about her. Okay, in a fantasy novel, that might be a little confusing, simply because maybe she exploded, you know? Maybe she called up a fireball. But he uses, like, seven different words for face. I think mean and, uh... Physiognomy might both be in there as well. And it's like, dude, like, they're four paragraphs apart. If you really feel like you need to talk about her face rather than just saying what her expression is, you could just use face. Which, you know, I don't want to pick on him for trying to use variety because that's actually quite commendable. But it was just so unnecessary to begin with. It was like finding all these different ways to say something you never needed to say in the first place. I mean, I keep saying him. I think I forgot to mention this is Thomas M. Reed, who, of course, is doing this entire trilogy. And if you remember my review of part one, I really enjoyed that. Overall, even though I thought it took a little bit to get started. This one, not the case at all. I kept waiting for it to kick in because I thought... You know, okay, the first one was enjoyable, and I remember somebody responding to my review and saying, wait for it, it gets a lot better. Well, hopefully that'll happen in book three. Uh, book two here was about, I'd say, 25 pages of plot. It was so drawn out, and I kept thinking, man, how is he going to like get through this plot? Since part one was essentially self-contained. I mean, you know, you have these running subplots and you assume they're building to something, but I felt like part two would be the same. We would kind of have the big threat, which is like the zombie invasion or whatever, get handled by part two, and then part three would be the subplot of kind of the takeover of the main house that we're dealing with, which of course I can't even think of their name, but it's the one with Van Bren and Zephyra and uh, Embrya, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which most of his main names are good. It's just these little minor characters like Flaw and Lobra that aren't so hot. But anyway... Point being, you know, we have like five decently major plot points that happen, but they are all strung over 300 pages, and there's no need for them to be. You know, none of it needed to take that long, and I don't know why he strung it out this much. It seriously feels like about 30 pages in, Reed was like, oh, crap, this was a two-book series, not a three-book series, and then was like, I'm contracted for three. What the hell do I do? Also, this one starts out with a prologue, which reminded me so much of book two of the Watercourse Trilogy's epilogue, because it was just like, and then he was a zombie, and it's like, supposed to be so scary or something, and it's like, okay, I, you know, I don't really care. I mean, I, it, it, Watercourse, at least it was a character we knew and kind of cared about here it's just some dude we meet in the prologue and it's like and then he was a zombie and it just i uh. so yeah this one huge letdown huge 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 letdown um if, if, if you're anywhere near my reading tastes and you're gonna read this trilogy i would definitely suggest skim the hell out of it or just skip to book three because I'm sure he's gonna tell us again what happened in book two once we get to book three. So I would just go book one, book three because book two, it's like, here's what happens. Vambrin gets taken hostage, he has sex with an elf and he goes back to uh, a zombie invasion. Um, Zephyra gets kidnapped and Brianna gets kidnapped but escapes and finds out that the, the, like, basically the Pope or whatever of the church there uh, has been, uh, you know, the, the his successor has been named, and it's this guy who's, like, totally against them, because, of course, that's where the uh, Van Bren's murder attempt came from. And, uh, what's his name? The other dude who is with Van Bren in the Sapphire Crescents gets turned into a zombie. There you go. That's everything that happens in that book that's worth a damn. I mean, seriously. And... That's frustrating. Really skippable. I know we went a little longer than usual, 
But we're getting ready for another break here, so I thought I'd do some more. All right, well, I will uh, see you in a few weeks or a few months, depending upon how long this break takes. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.